Cynthia, thank you for that gracious introduction. I want to get right into our conversation this evening with three stellar women leaders who are being recognized as women leaders in pro bono. These women have develop, de devoted their time, talent, and treasure to vaults. I'm talking about Betsy Plevin, who is a partner at Proskauer Rose and a former president of the New York City Bar. Betsy, where's that award? I'll show it here. Thank you so much to Vols for this wonderful recognition. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Shane Boston, a partner at Arnold and Porter K. Scholler and the recently inducted president of the New York City Bar. Sheila, where's your award? Mine looks just like Betsy's. I just want to thank Vols for this beautiful award and especially Marsha Levy who took the time to make sure that it arrived. All of our awards arrived for this evening. And finally, but not least, Kate Oberlees O'Leary, who's the Global Executive Litigation Counsel at General Electric. Where's that award, Kate? <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you to Marcia and Bowles for this wonderful award. I wanna begin asking each of you why pro bono work is important to you as lawyers in this, this august profession. Why did you do it? So should I start? Anyway, okay. Please do that. Well, I, I think that as, as these challenging times remind us, uh, there is uh, such uh, a tremendous need to secure justice for everyone in our society. And as we're structured in our legal system, it's, it's very hard to secure justice, even at the smallest level, if you will, without... Uh, having legal counsel and the people who need to secure economic justice, good housing, etc., need a lawyer to represent them in, in, as, as an advocate and, and pro bono counsel in particular because these are people who cannot generally afford counsel. So that to me is why pro bono work is so important. Well said. Sheila? In my DNA, Michelle. I am the daughter of a Black Baptist preacher and a very loving and giving first lady of the church. And that's what I grew up with, seeing them helping others, especially those in need, the most vulnerable in our society, those who need a safety net. Uh, it's what I've learned and it's what I've been charged to do. Absolutely. And Kate, your, your, your views on this. Yeah, well, I think like a lot of people, I decided to become a lawyer because I wanted to have a positive impact in the world and be able to use my skills to further the cause of justice. And I also strongly believe that with the privilege of being a lawyer comes the responsibility to do that work, uh, to make the system better and fairer for everyone. And pro bono work is an important tool uh, in terms of being able to try to accomplish that. And, and I also just love doing it. It's the um, one of the most satisfying parts of, of being a lawyer is the ability to use those skills to, uh, to help individual people. You know, it's interesting when I listen to some of the ways in which you describe this, what you think is an obligation, whether it's securing justice, the fact that it's in your DNA, and then Kate mentioned that you've always wanted to make a difference in the world. Yet, each of you would have to say that every lawyer doesn't feel that. I don't think it's their obligation to do this kind of work. What do you say to people like that? Sheila, are you speechless? Okay, no, not at all. I'm sorry. Go for it. Um, two things that I especially emphasize. One is that, okay, if I can't convince you to join the choir and understand that it's a moral imperative, if I can't make you understand noblesse oblige, that to whom much is given, much is required, then daggone it, understand this. If you engage in pro bono work, it is legal services. You can gain additional legal skill sets. It's important experience. It can actually enhance your professional career. Secondly, I always encourage such people to find out what their clients are interested in when it comes to pro bono services. Because you can actually work with clients or you can engage in pro bono work um, about which they are passionate. And therefore there's an ROI, quite frankly, return on investment. 
Okay, there is a bottom line business imperative to do it as well. So those are the two things I usually use to kind of convince people to join the choir. What about you, Betsy? Well, I also uh, encourage people to do the kind of uh, pro bono work that we can today with guidance from uh, legal services organizations to get experience. That's another uh, plus plus, if you will, to to doing pro bono work for a young lawyer to have a chance to, first of all, have client relationships uh, at, at a junior, relatively junior age, and also to go to court and represent parties uh, and have that wonderful feeling at the end of the day of success of uh, obtaining, you know, social security disability benefits for someone at need, you know, who needs it. Uh, it's a great satisfaction element too. That's I want to stick with you because I would ha have to imagine that you encountered barriers when you decided you were going to do this type of work. Can you describe what you did encounter and how you didn't let that dissuade you? <laughs> sure. Um, and you're right. It was a long time ago when I was starting out in my practice. Uh, and at that time, there really weren't the kinds of legal organizations, legal services organizations like VALS, uh, that really focused on pro bono, you know, supporting pro bono work. So if you were, you know, when I was a junior lawyer, wanted to do pro bono work, you were kind of on your own. Uh, and most of the needs were in areas of the law that you didn't have any experience with. Uh, social services, government benefits, things like that. Uh, whereas today, it's much easier, uh, I think, for lawyers without that experience to partner with uh, organizations like VALS who make it their business to really mentor and train uh, young lawyers who are interested in doing pro bono work. And it's, it's just such a big, big difference to me. And Sheila, I, want, I wonder, when, when Betsy talks about the barriers she encountered, as a woman of color, I would venture to say that you would have encountered barriers, but they might have been a little different, some of them. How did you navigate Definitely. that? In, indeed. So it, it cuts in different ways. So, for example, as a woman of color, I will tell you, communities of color expect you to do pro bono work. Okay? They're like, you've made it. Now you have to help the rest of us. Okay, so keep that in mind. On the other hand, when you're, especially if you're in a big law firm, such as I am, um, there are certain expectations as well. We all know that you have billable hours and that you must complete a certain amount of billable hours. And even if you are encouraged to do non-billable work, such as pro bono work, um, there are these pressures of the balance of how much you're able to do. Because as a woman of color, let's face it, in this nation, uh, especially black women, they only earn about 67 cents to every dollar that a white male makes. So there are economic, let's say, considerations, considerations and possibly even sacrifices when you're at a firm, you're a woman of color, you're trying to make it, be successful, look great to your billable clients and your partners, but at the same time, you feel an obligation to help your community and to do pro bono work, which is non-billable. And let's not even mention, or I should mention, I should say, I'd be remiss if I didn't, unconscious biases that set in. You know, there are some partners who may think that, well, you're supposed to do that kind of work because you're a woman of color. So uh, there's an intersectionality, if you will, between race and gender and uh, a lot to navigate. Well, did, you, did any of you ever feel that you were burning a candle at both ends trying to do your pro bono work and your billable hours? And how did you just, obviously you didn't disintegrate because you're all sitting here very successful. So what did you do to maintain that equilibrium? I find For me, it's a strong support network. Yeah. Let, us, let me go. go, ahead. Let me go. Hey, Kate, go. Um, what I was going to say is I find that the pro bono work really energizes me. And, and to the extent that I feel like I'm burning out or um, getting fatigued with the other work that I'm doing, um, it's, a, it's a, something that I'm very passionate about and something that feels like a way of connecting with the community in a way that's different from the day-to-day -day practice of law. So for me, it's they're complementary, and it's it's frankly something that's kept me going as a lawyer for many years in terms of, of uh, continuing to stay fresh and feel excited about being a lawyer. You know, one of the things that sometimes happens 
when you're an inside counsel is people don't think inside lawyers have to do pro bono work. That's for the law firms and the, the big partners that make all the money. Let them give back to the community. Did you feel greater pressure to support pro bono initiatives internally? That is, was it expected of you because that's what women do, because we're consensus builders and we're nurturing? You know, you've heard all the nice yeah. words. I've thought a lot about this question. I think it's a really great question. I think for me personally, it's something I've always been passionate about. And luckily, I have um, managed to work at places where there was a lot of support for that. And I've had a lot of terrific mentors in legal services, starting with the judge I clerked for, Judge Morris Lasker, who was um, passionate about public service and really instilled that in me as well. And at GE, where I've been for the last 18 years, I've been really lucky to work with three general counsels, all of whom are dedicated and passionate about pro bono, Brackett Denniston, Alex Dimitriev, and now most recently Mike Holston. So I feel like I've been very lucky uh, institutionally to be part of a company that does care about giving back to the community in general. It's part of what all of our employees are expected to do in the communities in which they live. And lawyers have a special responsibility to do that because of our ethical obligations and because of our ability to, um, to assist in access to justice and rule of law around the world. So it's something that we're always trying to do more of. And I would say for, for me, the institutional imperative has been find a way for people all over the world to get involved in doing this work. So I, you know, in that way, I think I've been, I've been very, very lucky. So you've had allyship think, throughout your in-house career. That's it. Betsy, did you want to say something? I just wanted to add that we can all make a contribution, not just a financial contribution, of course, which is helpful, mm -hmm. but, uh, and, and should be on everybody's list, but we can all be advocates for legal services uh, for people in need and, in our talk and in our walk, uh, even if you're not doing a lot of it, you can be an advocate for it, which is important too. Well, I would imagine that the three of you are role models. And if other people see how successful you've been in accomplishing all the things you do, including the contributions you've made to an organization like Vols, they would say, well, if she can do it, I can do it. Isn't that what you hope the message is? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So let's switch gears a minute. There has been a tendency to separate pro bono from diversity and inclusion as though they're being treated as separate, separate initiatives. Why does that miss the mark and you're not really taking an opportunity to bring the two together to get more momentum? Why is that a mistake to, to see them as separate? Kate or Betsy, either one. Yeah, I, would, I would love to address this. Um, I. I had the privilege earlier this month of participating in uh, the summit that Vols put together on the intersection between pro bono and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it was a really wonderful uh, program that focused a lot on the importance of cultural competence. And I think that that's important as we bring our legal skills to try to address problems in the world to remember that a lot of times how we do things is a, as important as what we do. And um, the need to, as lawyers, come at the task of pro bono with a sense of humility, empathy, and, and really intentional listening. Uh, often we're serving communities that may not be similar to the communities that we came from. We're the experts on legal service, but the clients are the experts on their own lives, their own experience, their own goals and how they see the world. And just like we would with any paying client, it's incumbent on us as lawyers to see the world from our client's perspective. And I think that also has great benefits for trying to create organizations that really have a demonstrated commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that make everyone feel comfortable and everyone feel like they're an important part of the firm or the company. So I, I think there's so much to be learned through pro bono about humility, about um, cultural competence, learning about communities that are different from ours. And, and I think that also uh, promotes and benefits our diversity efforts. It sounds like what you're saying is you get as much as you give. Absolutely. I feel like I get far more than I give. And, and I tell people that all the time in terms of 
um, trying to inspire people to do pro bono, it, it um, not only makes you a better lawyer, it makes you a better person. And I think um, makes your legal practice more satisfying. Sheila, you want to add anything? I would agree. I mean, there is a definite intersection if you just look at the statistics. Black and brown communities are disproportionately a part of those at the poverty line and under. Um, you know, whether it's high unemployment, whether it is uh, having the most difficult or having uh, excessive health conditions, bad health conditions at, at that, the highest mortality rates, uh, disproportionately these uh, various factors affect brown and, and black communities more so. And therefore, when you do good, when you do pro bono work, more often than not, you are helping also with racial inequities as well. So it's very important. Cultural competency, thank you, Kate, that is extremely important. That's why it's also important we have lawyers who speak different languages so that we can service communities that may not speak English. All of this comes into play, but race and economics throughout our history, they are, there's definitely an intersection and they each influence one another. You know, it's funny, Betsy, I think that's what you were saying at the outset about when you started doing this, you couldn't have turned to a sophisticated organization like VOLS to get direction and training on cultural competencies or bias. You had to figure it out on your that's own. True. Now, that's not the case. Yeah. No, you're absolutely so let right. Switch, let me switch to this question. We're going to do just two more questions. So I, I try to keep us on time and don't get any demerits. So recent events have brought to the forefront racial and economic disparities in this country and living color, no pun intended. We see that the novel corona coronavirus has impacted communities of color, not just in healthcare outcomes, but also in unemployment, who frontline workers are, and small businesses just struggling to survive. And of course, then you have the response to the homicide of George Floyd that has surfaced these chronic issues even more starkly. What would the three of you say to the legal profession, the legal community, about the role it should and, and can play in addressing these inequities? Kate, you wanna begin? Sure, um, I think lawyers, especially at this time, have an obligation to use their privilege and their knowledge to further the cause of justice in the world. Uh, by doing pro bono work, by getting involved in changing unfair laws and policies, and by doing whatever they can to improve access to justice. I think it's also very important that we educate ourselves. Um, if, if you have colleagues who um, don't understand what's going on, who are uncomfortable with some of the topics that are being raised, this is a time when we all have to be willing to get uncomfortable and to talk about difficult issues uh, with people, because let's face it, as lawyers, we are inherently in a position of privilege and to understand what that privilege is, how it has shaped our lives and how it impacts other people who are not in that same position of privilege and to do whatever we can to try to move things along. And, and if people don't feel like they have the ability or the time to do pro bono work right now, I also, feel perfectly comfortable telling people it's okay to write a check, right? So, um, because there's a lot of great legal services organizations out there, in particular VALS, um, but others as well, where you can put your financial resources uh, to good use if you just don't feel like you have the capacity to get personally involved right now. But I do encourage people to get personally involved because not only can you change someone else's life, but you you'll change your life. That's what you want to add to that? Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, I think lawyers uh, have the skill and ability and, and as Kate said, the privilege uh, to be part of and historically have been part of addressing inequities in our society and, and importantly, to develop the legal strategies uh, that will help correct these inequities that have been uh, so dramatically brought to our attention yet again. And working both as lawyers, therefore, and thinking about these issues and, and how to address them, and also playing a role as community leaders, which lawyers have often done, 
uh, is also an important part of, of being an advocate at this stage of our civilization, if you will. Absolutely. Sure. Lawyers are problem to. solvers. Yeah, we are. <laughs> Lawyers are problem solvers. That's what we have to do. Um, we should be involved with this. I feel like our nation is at a crossroads, quite frankly. Um, this is the time where we decide in which direction we are going to go. Are we really about access to justice? Are we really about fairness? And if so, the lawyers in particular have to dive in. Throughout history, we have made dramatic strides for this nation. Take Brown versus Board of Education as a, as a prime example. We actually served as not just lawyers, but and, and I know some people cringe about this, but to some degree, social engineers, okay? We can help this country on its path to salvation so that we have less of a racial divide, less of an economic divide, and so that we can all actually have life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Lawyers are crucial in this, and legal organizations such as Vols play a very vital role in making sure that we go on that right road, the path to access to justice. So all I need to do is clone the three of you because we absolutely need more lawyers who think and do like you, right? You don't have to answer that question. So I'm going to ask you the final question, which is assume that you are writing a chapter in your memoir that chronicles your pro bono service. What is the title of that chapter or the key message in that chapter? Betsy, I'll start with you. My title is So Much More to Do. Absolutely. Sheila. To whom much is given, much is required. And I would hope that they say that Sheila did the best with what she had and that she not only talked the talk, but walked the walk. Kate. Uh, echoing what Brenna said earlier about the moral arc of the universe bending towards justice, which of course was a famous quote from Dr. King, um, I would call the chapter Bending the Arc. Uh, and I'm also thinking about what Eric Holder said a few years ago with reference to that quote, and he essentially said, if the arc of the universe bends towards justice, it's because people are pulling it. And, and that is the work that remains to be done and, and the work in which we are engaged and the work that I'm proud to be part of. Well, it is very clear to me why you've been selected to be honorees. So we want to thank you for being woke, as the young people would say. But more importantly, I want to thank you for doing the necessary work. Or, or to quote Marsha, thank you for always raising your hands. You have our admiration. You have our gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And all of thank you. you.